Hello everybody, how are we doing out there? Hey, it's Marcia O'Connor. I'm talking about HR and recruiting and I'm um, good to see everybody today. Sorry for a little delay there this morning. Um, you know what, it's interesting is uh, there's so much going on and obviously today I'm sure you all have heard about what's happening over um, overseas. And uh, we're just gonna hope everything goes well today for all of our colleagues and friends out there because you know, it's, it's a little scary right now out there. So keep it moving out there. Hey, I wanted to say welcome back and we're here to learn about HR and you know, just ask questions away. And now the hard part is, I think sometimes you guys put notes down there or like little messages. Sorry, it's hard for me to see that sometimes um, what I'm trying to do here. So I'm gonna put my little notes down here and see where questions come in and all that good stuff. So hopefully I can do all that with you guys today. But nonetheless, let's go into the questions. Okay, number one, from Ricardo. Hello, Ricardo. Um, question asks, where are the best places to look for new hires these days, especially barbers? Um, you know, I gotta be honest with you, it's to me, I feel as if right now, it is all about your connections and your network. And a lot of times too, depending upon where you do, like figure out what those skills are, there's gotta be some kind of commonality, some kind of trends, something that they hang out with and do things and all. And a lot of people, I know a lot of barbers I, that I've seen like, you know, like tattoos. And um, maybe talk to your tattoo salon in the area and just be like, hey, you know, we're looking to hire some really good people. Who do you have in here? And, um, and some people aren't, you know, but, all depends upon where they hang out. Like think like a recruiter. And I've been a recruiter a um, majority of my life actually. And what I would always tell people, like think like a recruiter and figure out where would people hang out with that kind of a background. So what if you go online and look at people's resumes who have that barber background, figure out what's in common on there. And there are certain things typically that they are, they have commonalities. Um, uh, for example, um, one of my, my hairdressers, kind of, I had a guy for years and he was phenomenal, but he was actually in the fashion industry as well. And um, so I said, where do you hang out with? He said, well, all these people, they make their own clothes and we do haircuts and all too. So it's really hanging out with that. And then make sure your employee referral bonus programs are somewhat decent um, and make a big deal of them because uh, we had to up ours as well. Um, but I've seen them range from like $500 up to like $5,000. But you wanna make sure that people recognize them and get recognized for people that they do refer because I do still believe that um, an employee referral is probably one of the best hires you can have not always but I would say 95% of the time um, but I would you know those are the things you want to do you also want to do just posting out there too I'm sure there's got to be you know like meetup groups for barber um, there's meetup groups for pickleball so it has to be for barbers as well and there's a lot of different things out there you know what you should just do do a Google search how do I find um, a barber? And see what commonalities that pop up with that. That might help you a little bit too, okay? I hope that helped Ricardo. And good luck. All right, Jessica, should I keep my business partner or work independently? I'm a nutrition coach. I originally opened it um, after signing a shareholders agreement, getting a bank account, she became unresponsive. Yeah, so uh, I've been there, done that. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, I learned pretty quickly that um, I had to dissolve that when I first started with somebody who I felt like I was doing probably 75% of the work and she was probably doing uh, 25 and she thought that was okay and doing what she did and I just, I just had no time and I actually dissolved that pretty quickly and then basically went out on my own a few months later. Um, you, you gotta be very careful guys when you sign a deal, especially a shareholders agreement with somebody as to specifically the agreement as to what is expected of them and what is expected of you. And I've heard this time and time again, um, some people love partners and have okay with it. I think what I find hard is if you have a lot of partners, the bigger you become, it's really hard to make decisions. And so those kind of things that really pop in there. Um, so that's one of the things you wanna make sure that you're aware of. I also wanna, um, yeah, so be careful about that. Just make sure you don't sign anything unless you're really certain this person's gonna give as much blood, sweat, and equity as you do. And once you're in it, you gotta figure out a way to get out of it because unfortunately it only gets worse unless you have that conversation and they change. Uh, and most of the times they do not. So unfortunately, more of a black and white answer there, but that's some of my advice, okay? Kristen, what are some things I need to consider when looking to hire a VA, a virtual assistant? How much should I expect to pay them? You know what, one of the things is, um, 
Unfortunately, I bought, I had gotten the VA way later than I should have. I should have gotten that person, I didn't realize they even had them um, like seven years ago, but uh, I should have gotten my person, her name is Erin, way sooner, and she has been phenomenal. But the idea behind it is just to take a lot off my plate. And guess what, she she has done that. And I feel like I feel much more prepared in what we're doing and how we're doing and why we're doing, and it just seems to work out really well. But I know, ironically enough, I think overall, we, the VA, you gotta be careful. They range in prices. Now, I use one out of South um, Carolina, and you know, right now I'm paying $35 an hour, but I've been using her for three years, so I know that, that rates have changed considerably because there's been such a demand for them. And you know, it's funny, if you can just do like, it's like simple work that you know somebody else can do, but it's taking up a lot of your time, it's totally worth it to get a VA because what you're saving basically is time for you to work basically on your business instead of in your business. And once you get to that point where you just feel like you just don't have enough time at all, believe it or not, because of that, um, figure out your budget for that. I started with mine thinking I would only need her five hours a week. I probably now use her about 20 hours a week, if not more. Um, and ironically enough, has given me a lot more time to do sales and basically build my company. And it sort of has paid for itself. Um, because now I feel like all those little pieces that I hated to do, she's now doing them, doing them very well. It's just figuring out who you want to pick, where you want to pick it from, and then basically training them ahead of time, but it does pay off with the right person. They will size you up because I had to do a Colby assessment, and it basically talks about your background and their background to make sure it's a really good match. I really highly suggest the one you use. Make sure you do have that assessment ahead of time because it does help you get the right person to help you out with that. Okay, but so worth it. But do your do your due diligence. Like there are several out there. I would say depending what state, they're probably gonna be different prices. Like for up here, they probably range about fifty dollars an hour in the Philadelphia um, area. But down south, uh, like I said, mine's thirty five dollars. So. It'll range. There's also ones in the Philippines that have been phenomenal, actually. My, my good friend, actually another um, mentor on here, Brad Stevens, has a phenomenal uh, virtual assistant company, and he uses them out of the Philippines, and you know what? They're phenomenal. So you just want to make sure, like, just, just do due diligence out there. Okay. All right. So Shane Noble. So hello, Shane. How do you get employees to follow outline processes? Um, you know what? I hate to say this, sometimes you just have to reiterate, reiterate, reiterate. And for example, um, you know, we actually have handbooks that they have to sign when they come on board. And it shows like, hey, you're telling me you signed this, that you've read it and gotten things moving. But if you do have a construction business, I obviously know there's a lot of stuff with safety and security. You just wanna make sure that you put training and development in place to make sure that they really understand it. And then maybe have them be like train the trainer where they actually teach it themselves so they understand the processes and the development behind it because this way they feel like they've taken accountability. So you, cause you can preach and preach and preach. And sometimes the preaching just doesn't work. So I want to make sure that you're very, very um, keen about that too. Okay. Um, next one is from Shane as well. How do we know, how do we show new employees, existing employees that are processed for doing certain things with jobs in the way we want them done? You know what, the biggest thing right now you want to do is um, video. Like people don't always have the time, but you can do a video to show people like, hey, here's the process steps of how to get this done and what we're doing. And like I said before, if you make them almost like a team captain and just say, hey, you're my team captain to show other people how to do this. People like me, you pick, you're picking me. And people like that accountability. People like that responsibility as well. And say, absolutely, how about you help me with that? They're gonna be your person out there as your team captain to help to make sure all of your employees are doing it right. But just to make sure it doesn't go to their head, you know, because that's one thing you don't wanna do and just say, I just need you to help me on this. And, and to basically, it gives them a lot of, bit of um, leadership experience as well too. All right, next question's from Shane. How do you hold managers accountable for when they don't do the thing they need to do for job deadlines? Um, you know what? Um, you, you gotta, you gotta write them up. You gotta basically say, hey, this was, ex okay, where weren't where were we clear? Here's the detail. Here's what you said. This is where it's at now. This hasn't happened. You, you gotta have some kind of um, uh, consequence, I guess the word is, um, in there. And you wanna make sure it's like, hey, this is a first offense. This is a second offense. And then figure out third offense. I have clients that they screw up one time, they're on a warning. 
and um, you know, either they get um, they lose their job or they get demoted. And you really want to make sure that's very clear so that consistency is key so you can't, oh, I like that one person better. You, you can't do that right now because it'll come back and haunt you. Um, but you want to make sure that it's very clear expectations are set. I can tell you we do that every quarter with my team. It also it ties to their bonus. Um, but it goes into what their goals are that quarter and how they're getting there, what kind of resources they need to make sure that they have all that. But it's really important that my managers are accountable for everything that we do, okay? Because that, that's going to be key. But they have to have consequences if they don't. And you got to put them in place. As and being CEO is tough because you don't want to be the bad guy. We never do. But unfortunately, you sort of have to be the bad guy in there sometimes. And you can do it. It all depends how you deliver the message, okay? So if you need any help with that, just give me a buzz. Um, and then also to uh, Gaber, hello Gaber, she asked the question, or I'm sorry, I'm assuming, she or he asked the question there, how can I get started figuring out what processes to develop and how many people to hire so that we're not overly dependent on any one particular employee? That's a great question. And you're doing about, you know, this much in revenue, you have three partners who work, you have seven employees. You know, I had a rule of thumb is if once once you literally got too much work and we were basically having people work 50, 60 hours, it was time to hire another person. Um, and you want to make sure to you have succession planning. So we have a buddy program here. So when we start with clients that we actually try to have like two people working on that client because if somebody leaves or somebody's on vacation or somebody gets sick, uh, we have a backup plan so that client doesn't go into freakazoid mode that they're both taken care of. And so you want to make sure that there's always, um, you know, just overlapping here to make sure that that doesn't happen, as well as, um, you know, we have a theme here too, that basically we have to be having so much revenue come in before I hire another full-time person. And, um, and sometimes we start people to part-time, then go into full-time. But you really want to have that model set up of what that means for you. Each company's going to be a little bit different. We're professional services. So um, and my rule of thumb is usually, um, I usually bring a person, like my, I have two people, I have billables, and I have, um, you know, truly like operations and admin. And so if I want to bring more admin on board, I got to bring at least six billables on board to pay for this person. And so there's a fine line behind all that, but I also have succession plannings on both sides to make sure somebody else knows somebody else's stuff because it just, it's painful the larger you become because what's happening is you have to basically, um, you know, fill in for that void. And so you want to make sure that you always have a lap, layover or a lap, basically, of two different people that sort of know which each other person's doing. Okay, very, very helpful, especially the bigger you become. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. So Darby Scott, hello Darby. Is it okay for management to suggest privately to an employee that they should be cautious in their personal lifestyle because it's affecting those at work. Um, a fine line, right? I always ask people, um, are you open for some constructive um, feedback? And um, depending upon how they answer that, um, will basically answer your question. So for example, um, we had given um, um, a person, my prior employee, some feedback about what they were putting onto um, their LinkedIn page. And that person um, didn't like the fact that they were, we were telling this person not to put, it, was just, it wasn't as positive as we would like it to be to represent her, but then that represented us. And, um, and then I think she got the message because obviously no more messages are going out there, but she wasn't happy about it and made that quite known. So it's really depending upon if somebody's willing to listen to that constructive cri criticism as well. Um, and let them know that. And just make sure you document that conversation too. So to prepare it and go back so that it's basically done. And you also want to make sure too, like, um, I'm a big believer when you have conversations like that, that there are four ears and not just two ears. So that means I usually do it with one of my team members in the same room with that person to make sure that that person doesn't take um, my words out of context. And I've seen that happen too, um, just to prepare yourself. So hopefully it is a touchy subject, but it, it all depends how you deliver the message and whether or not they are open to be coachable, okay? But I always ask that question ahead of time. Are you open for constructive um, feedback? And You'd be surprised the answer on that because someone's automatically like, yes, or someone's like, why? And then you want to make sure, like, because I'm going to tell you something that will be, so you might be 
upset about or angry about, I need to make sure that I'm only here to hurt, help you, not to hurt you. And I think that calms them down a little bit, but some people still are in good, even though they told you that. So be careful how you deal, but also put it in writing that you've done it as well, okay? All right, AJ. How you doing, AJ? Um, okay, what can I expect as our business grows to 250000 in revenues this year? Uh, you know what? It's, it's people process technology, and you have to figure out how that's all going to impact and all, too. So you have to figure out, like, what kind of taxes that you're going to have. you got to figure out your expenses. you got to figure out your headcount. Um, you, you have all these different things popping along, as long as it's going to hit your goal where you're going to go. But that's a, it's a loaded question. You had mentioned here this year my marketing agency's revenue was goal was that, uh, which was what, 1.5, which you gross. I know that things are going to change. Thinking about some of those things might be done. It's figuring out, you know, what you're doing with that. I, when I first started, I put everything back into the business to help pay for payroll for new people and figuring out what was the minimal amount I needed to just, you know, survive at home and putting that whole spreadsheet together. But what I would do is have a one year, three year, and a 10 year plan. Just basically where you want to be, vision it as to how many employees, how much products, what you're doing. Because I'll tell people all the time, they'll say to me, well, we want to make $500,000 in revenue. I'm like, that's great. How are you doing it per month? per week, per day. And once you start thinking that way of how you're gonna to get to that, then you realize all the different things you're gonna to need to do that. And then do you need more people? Because obviously, if you keep growing like that, you're gonna need more people to do that work. But who's your priority for your list? And that's really putting together almost like a strategic plan. And there are a lot of great mentors that Sean has on here. They can help you out with that too. I mean, phenomenal ones. Um, so definitely reach out to them because you're gonna need a plan of action to make sure you stick to it. Because it's fun, it's fun having more money. It's fun growing. But what happens is a lot of times those processes you don't put in place. Meaning, like, do you have an HR system? Do you have, basically, when someone comes on board, all that paperwork, who's in charge of it? Where does it go? Is that compliance done? Do you have a handbook? Do you have all these other areas? All these things you gotta start thinking of. So you wanna make sure that you, know, you, you, you really write it out. Talk to a lot of the mentors that Sean has here and all too to figure out what's needed next, okay? Next one is from Dina. Hello, Dina. How do I start wholesaling wedding dresses to bridal shops? Ugh. I don't know that answer. I'm going to pass. I do apologize. But again, before, Sean has amazing people who are great mentors on here. Probably can answer that question better than me. Um, Nadia, when first starting out in a business as a stylist to make extra money, would you have a second job or a side hustle or gig? Uh, listen, I had a side hustle when I first started. I had one for about a year before I started getting more checks in from my business. And it was um, selling makeup, actually. And it was one of the best things I ever did because they gave you free sales training and they gave you free pop me up sales training. And it was great because that actually helped me more than I could ever imagine. And it just made me like I'm not having a bad day with the business. And we're at a client that called and said, no, I would go to those evening events. And I was like, yes. I got this, you know, um, because every no you get gets you closer to a yes. Don't forget that. Um, but I would highly do it. Just make sure that you have the time because my selling makeup was in people's homes at evening and my son was young. Really, really hard. Um, but then I started getting it built up and it actually started bringing in commission checks to, to at least, you know, pay for pay for the food for the month. And um, and it really did help. But you gotta you gotta have grit and you can't give up and you gotta make sure that, you know, you take care of yourself too because you can burn out pretty fast, okay? So be careful about that. And it gets very attractive. When you start a company and then someone calls you and say, hey, work for me, it's very, very attractive to say yes. But you have to figure out what your long-term goals are and are you gonna be on your deathbed that coulda, shoulda, woulda. And you, once you figure that out and say, I wanna try it, I'm gonna make it, you will make it, but you always have to believe that, okay? Next question is from Patrick, Pat Joseph. What are the standard percentage of annual gross income for annual spend on legal fees, marketing, and self-development? Um, honestly, for me, it's like 10 to 15 to 20 percent, but it ranges upon it ranges on a bunch of stuff. It ranges on your company. It ranges on your people. It ranges how much you're paying for your people. Because, like for example, if I was a technology company, I would literally have you know a lot of um, expenses for payroll because the .NET developers are so expensive right now. Or if I had product, and it, it, there's so many, there's so many things involved with that conversation. There, I would say again, work with some people who have really good accounting and finance that um, Sean has on here for uh, mentors, and reach out to them. Then they can actually come up with a formula to help you out with that. Okay, um, Rachel, hello, Rachel. 
And how do I trust a hire my business model and secrets? Um, well, one of the things you can do is pretty much basically put in there um, a confidentiality agreement. So when they start with your offer letter, they have to sign that to even get started and be very clear about what that means. Um, so I tell people like, you know, what, what happens here stays here, but let's get real doesn't always happen you just have a lot of faith that it's going to but the confidentiality confidentiality agreement will definitely help you on that you also might want to have um, a non-disclosure an NDA um, agreement too, if you're going into like secrets and you know percentages and numbers and stuff like that too um, now is it binding it it is binding but people still have basically gotten away or like you know gone to a different client that was your vendor and stuff like that too but having things in place gives a little bit of a fear to people so they don't have to open their mouths and spill the beans but do it in a way where it's like you're protecting us growing and making sure that people all that information stays here there's just a way to do it but there's actually there's two agreements confidentiality and an NDA which will definitely help you with that non-disclosure agreement and the last question here is Sebastian. Hello, Sebastian. Which is the best way to get commercial contracts or clients? Um, I have a cleaning company um, and contracts. Um, you know, with a cleaning company, I can tell you out here in the King of Prussia area because people are starting to go back into the offices and people are starting to use cleaning services again. Um, I think it comes down to just um, doing a great job, getting connections, being out there, being likable, having great staff, and doing that. Like, there's a lot of cleaning companies out there. I honestly think the best way to do this is be different. Be that subject matter expert out there that like, you know, hey, did you know we're cleaning your office that if this happens? And did you know that if you add plants that offers this? Actually, by the way, Sean has a plant person too on here that you should reach out to to basically let your clients know to use these plants for good air um, conditioning in the office. Um, and by the way, Robin by um, Art by Robin is on here too. I just ordered a few prints for her from my office. So all these different things you can work and be a really great resource for these commercial clients because I think we're as as a commercial client, I love when people are sharing ideas and resources to me. So be that one percent out there and be different of how you're thinking of you're not just a commercial cleaning company, you're more than that. You know, I can help you. I noticed that you might need pictures. I've got a contact over here who can help you out with that. Hey, I noticed you probably could use some plants over here. Hey, I have a contact for that. You know what? I noticed that um, your rugs are dirty. I have a cleaner for that. Do you want to do that instead? And, you know, I mean, I have a, you know, I saw some little droppings of some rat. We have a rat guy on this on this uh, mentorship here. So I would definitely look into all those things to be different. Be that resource for them. Because, you know what? Most people don't do that. So be that change. Be that 1%. And you know what, you'd be surprised. Our big thing here is do the right thing. And so even if it's not a right fit for me, I'll give it to one of my colleagues out there who's a competitor. And they're like, why are you doing that? I said, because I can't help you right now and you need help. And I said, your best thing is you want to focus on this and so I'm going to give you somebody who can help you. That's the whole idea. And so again, be different out there. So I hope that helps for today. I'm sorry. Um, it was so fast today. There's so much going on today out there in the world as well. So just hang in there. Let's all keep positive out there, stick together, and um, like I said, just pray for peace, people. So nonetheless, I will um, talk to you guys soon. Have a wonderful day. Put a good jam on while you're working. Get you all in a good mood. Take care of your people. Say thank you. Don't forget, Employee Appreciation Day is coming up March 4th, so make sure you're doing something for them. Even if it's a small, go on your phone, text them with a little video, and just say, hey, thanks for what you're doing. It goes a long, long way, guys, and that's free. So make sure that you do something for them on March 4th. Okay? That's it. March is out. Talk to you guys soon. Have a wonderful day. If you need anything, moconnor at tocgrp.com or basically find me on my website, tocgrp.com. All the info information goes right back to me, okay? All right, guys, have a good one. Take care, bye-bye.